Hi guys, very good evening. How are you? So, are you able to see me? Great, great. So I see lot of uh, lot of you are excited for today's session. So great. So we have over hundred people who have joined. So yes, it will be available. So today uh, we are going to build a coronavirus detection system. Okay. And it's going to be a fun building a project that can actually work in real life as well. Okay, so me and Mohit were sitting and uh, we were thinking if we can just try and train out the train out a model uh, on available data. So yes, uh, we would be doing binary classification and uh, treat it like uh, as a uh, good educational project. Okay. So we would be using Keras, which uses TensorFlow on the back backend. So effectively, if you know any deep learning framework, you can actually build a classification model. So I will just uh, give you some insights. What are the things you need to keep in mind while building a CNN? And uh, since this data set is very different from the regular data sets you work with, especially those kinds of data sets in which you have cars or birds and animals, ImageNet data set. So it's pretty different. It's a data set of uh, x-rays that we are going to have in this case. OK, so. Uh, yeah, so I'm not from this background. Will I understand this? So probably some of the concepts you will be able to understand. OK, and some of the things which you need to go in more detail, that is CNN. And in the description of this video, I have given a link from where you can study CNN as well. Okay. So let's begin. Okay. Uh, hi, Praneet. Hope you are doing well. So let's begin. Okay. So firstly, as you know, that uh, COVID situation has um, affected all the countries all across the world. and there is a need of doing rapid testing, rapid uh, evaluation of results. OK. okay. So yeah, so let me just. Yeah, this is fine. This looks fine. OK. How to work with DCM files. OK, so DCM files basically uh, you there are libraries in Python from which you can work with DCM files. So when you work with uh, CT scans or MRIs, you get generally these type of data. You have you get DCM files or you get nifty files. OK, so but for our example, we would be uh, using X-ray data. Those will be uh, JPG images. OK, so. So one. Uh, the advantage of doing detection using x-rays is that blood tests are quite costly. You can see it, uh, it is uh, uh, costing around 5000 rupees for one blood test. And it takes a lot of time. Around five hours are needed to do one blood test. And from blood test, of, if you use an x-ray, you can also detect how much is the spread of uh, coronavirus in lungs because it uh, affects your uh, bronchioles and the lung airways from which the air passes and it causes some problems in the lungs. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not a medical expert, so I cannot explain, explain in more detail, uh, what exact problems it causes in lungs, but yes, there are some terms like fibrosis or, uh, blockage in alveolus. That is your air sacs. So that's what coronavirus does. And that can be actually analyzed with the X-ray data as well. If the, impact is like intermediate to severe. Okay. And uh, once you have that particular image, you can use image classification models. 
and you can also use segmentation techniques to find out that particular region that is affected and uh, we will be using some data set that uh, links I have also given in the description also and uh, we have not done a lot of research on this but we spent around a day or so uh, figuring out what works well on this kind of a data so we came up with a CNN based model so me and Mohit were working on this data set so uh, COVID uh, we, so there is a repo uh, this is the GitHub repo and these people it's a team of doctors who is collecting uh, data regularly so a few days back there were around 100 positive samples so I downloaded this data set around uh, two days back so I got 142 positive COVID samples from this data set and so this data set only maintains the positive samples okay so in order to train a classifier you should actually give both type of images the positive samples and the negative samples as well okay so what we did is we uh, went to the Kaggle and there is a very popular uh, chest x-ray data set on Kaggle so that data set basically gives you uh, images in three categories so it's it belongs to the normal category uh, the bacterial pneumonia and the viral pneumonia okay so for our case we wanted to do a classification between the covid cases and the normal cases so what we did is we uh, combined images from these two data sets so we took the images from the first data set that is there on github and you can see this is a, a active project it's going on it's getting updated uh, every day almost and you can see uh, there are images and these images are of uh, like covid patients who have uh, gone through the x-rays as well okay okay so you just download uh, this github repository and you will get the data and from that we need to do some kind of extraction as well okay so you can see there is a metadata.csv file okay So I can see a lot of uh, comments are coming up. So PyTorch better than TensorFlow. So both are good. You can work with anyone, but uh, Py I will suggest to go with PyTorch, okay? So you can see there is a metadata file. And uh, so now in the X-ray data, there are also the diagnosis it's given it's uh, the patient has SARS okay so there are uh, different type of diagnosis that are, that are there so we basically need to work on those rows which have been uh, tested positive for COVID-19 okay so firstly what we will do we will also uh, parse this uh, data file and we will find out those rows and the images okay so this is the path to the image that's given and we will uh, Right. So we will use it to uh, uh, extract all the po COVID positive cases. Okay. So this is the first data set and the second data set is from Kaggle. From, from that data set, I will pick all the images that lie in the normal category. Okay. So that's what I will uh, pick. Okay. So that's about the data set. So let's see. Okay. So can you make a guess? Uh, which one is positive and which one is negative just by looking at the data okay so it's a challenge for you so uh, can you make any guesses let's see so the, i'm going to show, showing you two images one of them is covid positive the other one is uh, covid negative so any guesses uh so we say, uh, Shubham says, right one is positive. Uh, why Why do you think so? Shreyansh, Rajat, Mohit, everyone is saying right one is positive. Why? Why? I don't see any reason. Come on, guys. Everyone is saying right one is positive except for two, two guys. Okay. So... It's it's Shubham says it, there is a blur in the X-ray. Okay, uh, white wala area. 
white spot i don't see any white spot in in this <laughs> so aditya says the left one is positive okay so actually yes uh, the left one is positive so all of you most of you have already failed okay so one or two guys got it right so the left one is actually a pos corona positive image and the right one is a normal image so that's why you can see it's 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 not an easy problem for radiologists to identify from x rays okay so uh these are uh, x rays from two different patients okay so do not uh, compare the rib structure or so that you just need to see some patterns which might be present inside lungs okay i think th this part is actually hard this part is hard okay but you need to see uh, the blurriness different type of textures that are present and also uh this image is a smaller image but when you see an x ray it's, it's a pretty big image so you can uh, see minute details inside it so that that could be another reason that we cannot spot it very easily plus the features that you will see in this uh, image are basically fi fine grain features okay so it's it's a difficult problem then finding dogs versus cats because those th these two images are visually lot of similar okay so it's a fine grain visual recognition problem okay so i do not know we are not doctors okay so we are not radiologists we do not know but uh, from the data set uh, we came to know that uh, the left one is a positive and the right one is a uh, negative so we will do a q, q and a session at the end of the stream you guys can keep on posting comments i am just going through all of them so the left one is a positive and the right one is a, is a is a negative image so uh we can actually build a classifier and as i said we tried building one classifier using a cnn it gave us almost 97% uh, accuracy in that okay and uh, also once you know once you have built a classifier okay will uh, just just says will this model be able to differentiate between other viral diseases and uh, covid detection uh yes so if you train train this model on other diseases uh, probably it should work and if there are some uh, you have sufficiently good data set and uh, there is some visual distinction between the viral pneumonia and the bacterial pneumonia generally it's a hard problem okay so if if there is a clear cut distinction then it would be easy for the model but if if since it's a it could be a slightly difficult problem than the normal cat versus dog classification problem there you need to come up with uh, more innovate innovations that will help you to uh, work with this these kinds of data sets okay so first thing is we we can do classification okay but uh, uh, suryansh uh, i am saying 97% on the validation data okay so it's it's not uh, the training accuracy it's it's the validation accuracy okay that's what i got okay so both training and uh, validation were, was close to uh, 97% okay so second is once you know from the machine okay this is a corona positive case and suppose even if your model is uh, let's say 97% uh, uh, accurate so do you think will it be practical to deploy such a model maybe what do you think matlab what would be the consequences if you leave uh 3 corona positive cases out of 100 cases so what consequences you can have in that case okay so if you let's say you uh, fail to detect 3 corona positive cases out of 100 positive cases and then those people may roam freely they can uh, contract a uh, lot of other people and they can spread corona and what it can it could be other way around also so maybe there could be three people who didn't had corona but your model detected them that as positive so they might be put in quarantine with other patients and they may get affected okay so when it comes to uh, medical imaging it it's very important that uh, your model should have very good accuracy because it's a question of human life okay so also once you know the model has done classification the second step that you should ideally do in such a model is the reasoning 
so you should ask your model why do you think it is positive okay so there are certain techniques like uh, class activation maps that can be done using an algorithm called grad cam silency maps you can generate and that will basically show you what what is the reason uh, or uh, what is the reason why the model thinks that it is a positive case so we can make some uh, visualizations uh, and you will see uh, you can draw a heat map to analyze okay this is the part that is uh, affected due to virus and uh, a radiologist can confirm this finding as well okay so that's another thing that we can do so it's it's important when you uh, use uh, deep learning models with the medical data you also see the reasoning part if it is correct then why it is correct okay so that's that's the other part so for today webinar we will just focus on the first part that is the classification part and uh, but we need to now learn how how do we identify what is positive and what is negative so i am assuming that uh, most of you are like beginners in deep learning so i will just give you a quick overview of uh, the model architecture and convolutional neural networks that we are going to build and i have posted a video in the description as well in which you can just go through it in more detail okay so now my next question to you is okay let me uh, try to make the problem simpler how do you distinguish a cat from a dog how do you uh, distinguish okay let's let me give you uh two images one of a cat one of a dog uh, both are wearing the uh, corona masks okay so why do you think so how do you classify cat versus dog okay come on guys i i, I want your answers ah uh, so pratik says eyes uh tapan says color so it, it is possible that both dog and the cat may have the same color okay so you you can have black colored dogs and you can have uh, brown colored uh eyes as well or brown colored cats as well so so yes so people are saying eyes ears nose tail uh, raghav says features so technically features is the right term okay so all of these uh things come under side come in features okay so height how do you know height okay so kasa if you click a picture of a cat from a very uh, close angle and you click a picture of dog from the very far angle so you cannot actually tell the computer oh, you cannot actually figure out from the image which is a cat which is a height uh, which is a dog based upon height okay so but there are specific details that these details are basically features okay so someone is saying voice okay so guys this is a image data you are given images you are not given actual cats and dogs so you you can just uh, listen the voice of the cat and listen the voice of the dog that that's not uh, correct right okay so basically all these all these things are are like features okay so that that's what you you can do okay so how do you distinguish cat from a dog the answer is features okay so we need we need uh, so when you see a cat you see there are different features present in a cat okay so let's say there is a pen you see okay pen has a tip pen has a button or it's 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 it has this particular shape then you say okay this object is a pen but if you want that your uh, algorithm should tell that this object is a cat or this object is a pen okay so what we do is we can extract small details okay we can extract okay this is how the eyes look like this is how the ears look like this is how the hair look like this is how the texture of the cat looks like okay so we 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 actually do in the first step we do feature extraction okay so the first step is given any image you uh, extract features out of it okay you can see from this image we are able to extract uh, features like this so let let me uh, tell you okay so just give me a second just give me a minute and i will be back
all right so uh, let's see so what we actually do is uh, given an image we try to find out uh, different features out of it okay so let's see so let's say you have uh, this particular kind of an image and you want to find out a different type of feature from it okay let's say you want to there is a tree in it there is a football in it and so on so what i can do is i can say okay i will uh, make a template okay i will make a filter and this filter and suppose i want to find out uh, this kind of a football from this image okay so uh, how you can do it so let let's assume this is a 2d or a 3d array okay so let's say it's a 2d or a 3d array and similarly you have a 2d filter okay so can you tell me how do you find okay where is this kind of a football present in this particular image so people are saying use face cam okay so so simple algor algorithmic problem okay so uh, let let me give you you have a 2d matrix and you want to find out uh, where is this kind of a ball present in in this particular image or if there is a ball in this particular image or not okay okay let me let me make it even simpler for example let's say you are given a linear linear array 1 2 3 6 4 8 11 and i say okay uh, i want to check uh, where is 8 present in this particular array how do you do it yes you use some kind of a sliding window you say okay i have a 8 i i put it i go go to every location and i check if there is a 8 at that particular location or not that's what you do right so you create a create a template you have a key and you try to slide it over through the entire array that's that's nothing but the linear search algorithm okay so similarly a similar linear search we can apply uh, on this particular image we can say okay we have this particular filter we will try to place this filter on every part of the image and we will try to slide it through the entire 2d region of that particular image okay so you uh, keep a filter you try to go through the entire uh, part of the 2d image so that's that's what you you can do and once you put this image here you can see okay there is a match you you see okay this uh, this pattern matches with this pattern that we have in this particular image so what we can do is if we want to extract different features of the cat for example if we want to extract eyes of the cat okay so what we will have we will have a filter we will have a filter that we will call as eye detector let's let's call this filter as cat eye detector okay so this filter will be nothing but it will be a matrix okay and what we will do we will try to place this filter up here and we will try to slide this filter through the entire this particular image okay so once you have uh, slided this filter through the entire image what you will get you will get an image like this you will see the region where this filter matches with the image part is maximum you you can see those those parts will be highlighted okay so that means uh these are the highlighted features and these features are nothing but cat eyes these are cat eyes okay and similarly if i give you another image and if i use a cat eye detector on a dog image let's say we have uh, we have a dog okay and if i use cat eye detector on the dog image what do you think will it uh, will be will will it be able to extract dog eyes as effectively as cat eyes yes or no what do you think yes or no okay obviously maybe some part of the dog eye may get detected because of the similarity but not as effective as cat eye because this filter has been uh, trained this filter has been learned to find out a cat eye so what what we do is we create different filters so those filters are learned by uh, during the training process of a neural network okay so uh, in the convolution operation what you will have is you will have a filter that will slide through the uh, entire uh, part of your image and it will uh, highlight the regions where those those uh, features are present okay 
so people are saying me to skip over the details and go go into the part of model building so definitely i'm just giving you an overview so we, i'm quickly uh, coming to the model building part as well okay so for example this is a simpler image so i i use this image and i defined a very simple filter okay so this is like this so you can see it's it's a 2d array it's a 3 cross 3 2d array and when i run this filter on my input image i get this output so can you tell me uh, what what is the effect of running this filter okay so what this filter is doing so what it is doing so it's it's kind of doing edge detection okay so it it highlights the edges so ananya has given me correct answer so guys if you don't know uh, ananya is now ananya is now going to join apple so you can ask for referrals from ananya if you want some referrals in the apple so he is the guy who is going to join apple very soon i think he has started working at apple right yeah so yes it's it's kind of doing edge detection so highlighting edges is one one uh, one kind of a feature okay so you you can have a uh, lot of complex features okay so so yes so what is the next step once you know uh, once you know uh, once you know the image you have to extract the features and once you know the features you have to do classification for classification we will use some kind of a neural network we will use some dense layers okay and in our case it's going to be a binary binary classification problem okay so uh, so we will have this type of a cnn architecture we will we will extract features so every cnn has two parts so the first part is a feature extractor so that is built using convolutional and pooling layers okay so i will uh, explain you while building the model so we will have convolutional plus pooling layers followed by we will have dense layers to do the classification okay so these are nothing but the dense layers so this is what makes a cnn so that's what is a cnn okay so we will now build a cnn model that will classify images based upon fine grained kind of visual features such as uh, texture sharpness blurriness okay so i do not know what is the correct feature for the covid uh, covid patient i do not know okay but we can give sufficient data to the model so that it can learn itself so this is the best thing about deep learning that even you don't know how do you how to classify but the model will try to learn given uh, you have the data okay so some of the prerequisites that uh, you should uh, you should uh, know for better understanding is how to pre process data uh, how to do visualization what is a neural network how does it train what is a cnn and uh, how do we train a cnn and any deep learning framework is fine you can use to uh, build this and some of you are already doing my course on uh, ml and dl that's there on coding blocks online okay so i have covered these topics in a lot of detail there okay so let's let's uh, now get into the coding part okay so let's uh, get into the coding part so uh, i have already uh, downloaded uh, the uh, two dataset folders that i have shown you one is the chest x ray data set from uh, kaggle and another is from the github okay so these are the two folders so we will first write a script that will uh, help us to generate data okay
just uh, give me a minute guys so we has we have uh, set up a local jupyter notebook and uh, let's uh, try to work with we will first try to uh, create a data set okay uh Okay, so let, let's uh, create a new file, okay? And let's call it as uh, dataset creator. Okay, so is this uh, screen visible? Just uh, let me know if if it is visible or not. Okay, so we will start uh, by importing pandas. So Vandit says yes, sir. Okay, great. So we will uh, first uh, create the data for the positive samples. And we will try to first uh, parse a file. Okay, so in in the chest X-ray dataset, we have this file called metadata.csv. So let me give the path of the file that is chest X-ray slash metadata.csv. Okay, and uh, also the path of images is in the same folder. That's in the chest X-ray, followed by images. Okay. So this is the uh, GitHub one, okay? And the second will be your that one, okay? So what I can do is I can use uh, pandas to read this particular file. So I can say data frame equals to pandas dot read CSV. And here I give the file path and let's also print how many rows and columns we have. So we have 350, 354 images. Uh, we have 354 rows and 28 columns. So let's see how does the structure look like. So this is how the structure looks like. And there is a column called finding, which basically denotes uh, the diagnosis. Okay. So that's what it is. And after that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, create a folder where where I will extract all the COVID images. Okay. So let's let's. Uh, create a folder here. Let's say, let's create a folder. Okay. So let's call this folder as data center where I will place the COVID images. Okay. So my target directory where I'm going to store my images. So it will be data set slash COVID. And that's that data set is now an empty folder. I can make another folder by the name of COVID inside my uh, data set directory that that what I can do. So we will use the OS module to create folders and move files in that. So guys, as I'm coding along, if you uh, think if there are any doubts, you can let me know in the charts. I am also going through the charts side by side. So what we can do is we can first create this directory. If not os.path.exists, so we can check if this target folder exists or not. If it does not exist, we can just make this folder os.make directory. And here I can save target directory. And we can say, okay, 
covid folder created you can create folder using python as well now if you go inside your dataset folder you will see uh, there is a empty covid folder which is also empty so what we will do we will uh, try to pick images from the covid dataset and we will try to place it in the covid folder that we have created so let's see how many images we have okay so i'm going to iterate over the data frame and i can see if row of finding equals covid 19 okay so if this is equal to covid 19 so it should be exactly like this so that you do not miss it so then you do let's say count plus equals one and let let me print count so that will basically show me how many images of covid we have okay now there is one more problem that is there is some of the x-rays have the front view okay okay and some of the x-rays have a top view or a side view okay so we do not need those x-rays we need to discard those x-rays so we only need the x-rays in which there is a front view so that is that information is there in another column in the file so that column is uh, called view okay so we need to write and row of view equals to pa so pa stands for a like uh, a medical term in x-rays so you can just google it okay so pa view of x-ray you can see what is a pa view of x-ray that's that's basically a kind of a front view okay so it's called a uh, posterior interior view that so we just want this particular view of the x-ray okay so now if i see the count now so it says uh sorry 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 this 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 condition should uh, come here okay so and row of uh, view equals to pa so you can see we are we are uh, getting around 142 images okay so let's get the name of that particular image so let's say file name is given by row of file name and the image path will be nothing but os.path.join whatever is my images path and the file name okay so i join them and then i will copy this image into a new path so i can say image copy path that's going to be os.path.join i'm going to copy images from the original directory into a target directory where i'm just picking the shortlisted images okay so i give that and i can use this function util dot copy to and here i give the image path that is my source path and another is my uh, path where i want to copy so here you can just print a statement uh, moving image and here you can print count target copy path is not defined uh, right so it, it's image copy path so you can see all the images have been actually copied so we have copied all 142 images in a new directory so now you can see dataset slash covid now it contains uh, all the images of covid so you can see it, it, it is a uh, lot of uh, it's a pretty large file and if you want to send this particular file to a, to a model then you basically need to reduce the size in order to uh, save a lot of your computation time that's what you need to do any, any doubts in uh, uh, till now anything you want to ask so i just iterated over the original data set that contains the covid images and i copied them into a new directory now next task is we need to create a folder that is going to be normal okay so we will create a another folder and this folder will contain the normal images okay so let's call this folder as the normal image images and for this folder we will use the data set that we have uh, downloaded from kaggle so it's the chest x-ray kaggle data set and from the training part you can see there is two folders one is normal and another is pneumonia we can just copy some of the images from the normal folder 
and we are we, we are done right that's what we can do okay so we just remove this line okay so now let's do sampling of images from kaggle dataset so kaggle dataset is a pretty big dataset it has around i think 6000 images so we can uh, just pick few samples okay we will not pick uh, all the images because that will disturb our class balance so what i want to do is i want to keep the class ratio as 50 50 okay so 50% covid images and 50% uh, the normal images so that that will be more useful so i can use i can randomly choose 142 images and i can just move them into into my uh, new folder so i'm going to use the random module so the kaggle file path is in uh, chest x-ray kaggle and then we have the train folder and then we have the normal folder and let's give the normal directory it's going to be dataset slash normal okay so we will put all these images here and let's see now what we want to do is we want to uh, move around let's say 142 images so what i can do is uh, i can say uh, first i i will extract all the image names and then i will pick random 142 images so i can say image names is given by os.listdir and here i give kaggle file path this will give me list of all the images that are present in this directory okay. so you can see all these images are there that that are there in the normal folder okay so okay so yeah we have the image names and i can just do random shuffling okay so image names that that will actually do the shuffling of all the image names in the list and let's pick 142 out of the uh, 142 images okay so yes so let's say the image that we want to pick will be the ayat image image names of i so guys what i did is suppose you had the images names as 1 2 3 up to up to let's say 6000 i say okay randomly shuffle them so i get something like this 5 1 2 2 0 4 and i will pick the first 142 images out of it okay so we have randomly shuffled the list of images and i'm going to pick the first 142 images to create my data set so image name is going to be image name i and the path of image will be nothing but os.path.join the kaggle file path and the image name so that name is image name and after that you define the target path where you want to copy the image so that going to be os.path.join and you give the normal directory and you give the image name that you want to keep okay and then you can just copy the images using this function and here you give image path that is your source and there is your target path and you can just print out to ensure that you're uh, copying okay so copying image i that's it so yes it's done and now we can check our folder okay so i can uh, check my folder here so go to the dataset and go to the normal folder and you can see you can see we have now 142 images right so i agree with uh, rajat okay so even those those uh, yes we will do the full project don't worry so we will do do uh, till the classification but there are lot of improvements which you you can do okay so there are a lot of add ons you can do in this project you can even make a web app you can improve the 
accuracy of the model you can add filter visualizations okay so a lot of things you can do it it's it's uh, i'm just covering the classification part okay so let's let's see what we can do next so now we have the data set ready so once you have the data set ready you can uh, divide it into two parts one for training part and one for the validation part okay so that's something you can do and since this image size is pretty big i will be using google collab to actually work with the data okay so to train the model i will be now going into the google collab so the data pre processing i have done on my system but rest of the work i will do on uh, google collab okay so i have uploaded this data set on uh, my dropbox folder from where i can uh, download it directly into the google collab that's what uh, we are going to do yes i will i will uh, put the link so the data set that i have created uh, i have hosted this uh, data set at this url http cb.lk slash covid underscore data okay. so what i can do i can use a wget command here to uh, download this data set and let me select the runtime as gpu so that we are able to train our model okay so let's download the data set from here you can see it's it's going to be a file on the dropbox let me show you okay so i think this is not the right link so it's it's actually covid underscore 19 this is the link So you can see we have uh, downloaded this data and this is cb.lk slash covid underscore 19. So that will actually give give you a zipped file. You can see it's a zipped file on uh, Dropbox. It's a zipped file. So now this file is now on your Google Collab. You can also check it here. So it's, it's this particular zip file. So next step is we need to unzip this file. Okay, so in order to get all the folders, we need to unzip the file that is named as covid underscore data. So uh, Sudesh, uh, we have posted a playlist, how to make apps out of models. You can also check the, those, okay? Uh, Okay, so you need to actually refresh it. Okay, so you unzip the file and you will uh, your let me see. Okay, so uh, the folder is getting downloaded and this is the folder. Okay, so that's the folder name is COVID underscore 19. And now I can uh, unzip this folder. So it, it has around 134 MB of data. That's what it is. Okay. Yes, it's COVID underscore 19, right? Okay, now you can see uh, if, if I refresh it, I, I now have a folder called COVID dataset, which has been extracted and it has two folders one is your uh, train and another is your validation and both of them have the same internal directory structure okay okay so now we have our data ready on google collab and we can uh, jump on building a model right 
so let me define a path for the training folder so training is given by we have covid data set slash train and we have validation path that is covid data set slash test So it, it's it's an image data, okay? So uh, there are direct images in it. So there are image files. If you want to see, you can just uh, click on any folder and see there are images in it, okay? And you can see it as well. So so it, it is going to open on this uh, this particular side. So you can see this is an X-ray image. It's a pretty big image. We will we will have to resize it, okay? So once we are done with this, we can uh, start by uh, importing few libraries that we will need. So one is NumPy, another is matplotlib. Then we need Keras, we need uh, layers in Keras. And we will need to import image as well. Okay, so let's uh, try to build a CNN-based model in Keras. Okay, so it's going to be a sequential model. So what happens in building a CNN is you actually have multiple layers. Okay, so first layer has some number of filters. The next layer has some number of filters. And another layer has some number of filters and so on. So it's it's going to be a layered ar architecture. So can you tell me why, why uh, layered architecture is helpful? So why layered architecture is helpful? Okay. And what we will do? We will uh, create multiple three or four CNN layers and followed by classification layers. Okay. So model is going to be sequential model. So now here is, is your time. You can ask some questions related to con layers. Okay. Why this number of filters? Why not X number of filters? Why not Y number of filters? So firstly, I'm going to put a convolution layer with 32 number of filters. Okay. So I'm keeping the number of filters as small in the beginning because the lower layers detect uh, features in very small part of the image. Okay. And if you just see a very small part of an image, there are very few patterns that you can make. Okay, so there are very few patterns like lines, dots, textures that what you can have. Okay. So yes, it, it is going to learn a hidden pattern. And as you go deeper into the network, okay, so your receptive field of the CNN layer increases, that means it the feature that it ex extracts is ba basically based on a bigger part in the original picture. Okay, so so that's that is what is me, uh, meant by a high level feature okay so i hope you you have gone through my video on cnn so you will have a better understanding of that so we will uh, keep 32 filters in, in the beginning okay so we have 32 feature extractors that's what is the meaning 32 different type of features we will extract in the first layer okay so it, it's a it's a 2d convolution okay so and then we have uh, kernel size is 3 cross 3 so why we are keeping this kernel size as 3 cross 3 because it's it's a standard choice okay these days so once from um, since the time of vdg 3 cross 3 kernels are uh, standard these days and we will use the relu activation and since this is the first layer we need to specify the input shape okay so we can uh, specify the shape as 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4 cross 3 As you can uh, ask any questions, okay. So I know it's it's getting a little longer. I could have, I can go into the details if you are interested. But if you're getting why we are uh, filling in these values, it's perfectly fine. We can just go on to the next step, okay. So once we have the con layer, we are going to add another con layer. Okay. So model dot add con two D, and then we can add sixty four layers, uh, sixty four filters, and each of size. 3 cross 3 
and we can have activation as fill. So after that, we will add a max pooling layer. It will be max pooling 2D. And the default choice for pool size is 2, 2. That that's the default size. Okay. So that that's the pooling layer. And uh, Nirmal, we are not going to use VGG because uh, since in the data set you have roughly how many images you have. Uh, I think we have uh, around 300 images, okay. And VGG network has around 140 million parameters. And if we train a VGG network, it, it is easily going to overfit, okay. It's, it's going to be difficult to work with a VGG network, okay. So any any questions, okay. So Rajat has given me some feedback. Uh, right, so what should we do, Rajat? You suggest, uh, Aaron, have you gone through my video on CNN? Have you gone through my video? Okay, so let me let me tell you uh, what happens when you stack multiple CNN layers on the top of each other. Okay, so let's say you have this image. Okay, and in the first layer, let's say you use a three cross three filter to find out some patterns and create outputs for the next layer. Okay, that's what you basically do. And in the next layer also, uh, we are going to use three cross three filter and we are going to extract some features. Okay. So what will happen in this case? So can you tell me uh, if I am at this particular location? So what is the effective size in the original image that I am looking at at this particular point? Okay. So let me tell you what happens by stacking multiple CNN layers. Okay. So here the kernel size is three comma three and in the next layer also the kernel size is three comma three. Okay. So what will happen is, uh, suppose you are, you are having your original image like this five, six, seven, eight, and you're doing a sliding window. Let's say it's a one D case. You are doing a sliding window of, uh, size three. So I'm assuming you are familiar with the convolution operation. Okay. So what do you do? You take a filter of size three and you slide it to form some outputs. Let's say you get an output X, then you slide it to next location. You get an output Y. Okay. And then you slide it to the next location. You get an output Z. Okay. okay. And something like this, you, you keep on doing. So what will happen is in the next layer, you will take these three as inputs and you will form one, one output. Let's say this output is O. So can you tell me on how many inputs this output O depends on how many numbers in the input, this output O is depending. So this is a question for you guys, for everyone. Okay. So input shape is two to four. So that means uh, whatever is my X-ray image, so the X-ray image will be reshaped into this size. So it will have two to four height width and the number of channels. That's what it is. So Praneet says nine. So Praneet, it's, it's actually not nine. It's, it's going to be something different. So what happens is, so guys, you have something like this one, two, three, four, five. So you have a filter of size three. It goes on the first location. It produces an output X. It goes on the next three numbers. It produces an output Y. It goes on next three numbers. It produces an output Z. Then in the next layer, you again pick the first three numbers and you produce an output O. So this O output basically depends upon five numbers in the original input. Okay. So that means the effective size is five. The effective size is five. Anshul says the X-ray is black. Uh, Anshul, it's it's not a grayscale image. It's an RGB image. If you try to load that image and uh, read it, okay, it, it has three number of channels because some of the X-rays are a little bluish in tone. They are some some of the X-rays are little yellowish in tone. So this is only possible if you have an uh, RGB image. Okay. 
so yes we are talking about this output basically depends upon five inputs in the original layer so this is what happens in 2d case also so when you are building a filter a 3 cross 3 filter in the first layer produces some outputs a 3 cross 3 filter in the next layer also produces some outputs but it looks at a region of 5 cross 5 in the original image so it it is looking at a bigger uh, bigger area in the original image so this is the concept of a receptive field okay so that means as you are going deeper into the network you are increasing the receptive field of the network okay so if i put one more uh, conv layer with with a 3 cross 3 filter so what's going to happen now yeah uh, hitesh my simple answer is you can also represent all grayscale images in rgb am i right if you uh, keep the values of all three channels as same you you can have those rgb images okay so how 3 cross 3 produces output so basically what happens is it's a matrix multiplication okay it it is matrix multiplication followed by sum so if you have a uh, numbers like a b c d e f g h i in the original image so what you will do you multiply it with the weights which are there in the kernel and then you sum, sum them all of them up okay so can you tell me what would be the receptive field at this particular point if if you now stack one more layer if you have let's say you combine these three o's to get some w okay or some let's say z so it will basically depend upon 7 cross 7 region in the original image okay so it 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 will have a receptive field of 7 cross 7 okay so as you go deeper into the network you you keep on increasing the receptive field and that's why the deeper layers in the network will detect higher level features okay so that's what we are going to do and also if you add max pooling it is going to further increase your receptive field so you are looking uh, you are looking at a bigger layer okay okay now one question is so if we actually need let's say a bigger region if we if we need a 5 cross 5 receptive field that we are achieving it by doing two layers of 3 cross 3 stacked on each other okay why we are not using a 5 cross 5 filter directly so why we are not using a 5 cross 5 filter directly what do you think so two uh, two conv layers stacked on the top of each other basically they represent a 5 cross 5 filter okay but we are not uh, doing this we are just making two different layers with 3 uh, cross 3 filters so any answers to this question you can get some goodies by answering this question okay so the answer is uh, i know people are getting impatient so i okay so we will uh, increase the speed okay so anshul has given me the correct answer so adding two layers will actually increase the non linearity so you can see uh, you have uh, non linearity here okay and also there are two reasons it will increase the non linearity so if you have one layer followed by non linearity but if you have a layer followed by non linearity followed by another layer followed by non linearity so it will increase the non linearity in the network and that will increase the hypothesis space that means we can represent more complex functions with a uh, more non linear function that's the one reason so increasing non linearity that's that's one reason okay and second is you also reduce the number of parameters so if you use a single 5 cross 5 kernel maybe let's say assume there is a single channel you will end up getting uh, 25 weight parameters okay but if you use uh, 2 3 cross 3 kernels so you will just get uh, 3 into 3 9 plus 9 you will have only 18 weight parameters okay so that will also help you to fight overfitting because your model is now going to contain less number of weights yes anshul says con plus relu will run twice that's 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 why uh, i'm saying it will increase the non linearity okay so i will not go into the details now i will just uh, quickly implement the model architecture and go into the training part okay so let's uh, complete the code so we have max pooling we need to add dropout to find uh, overfitting 
so it it is going to take some time to train in in that time i'm going to answer your comments as well okay so let's add another con flare with three cross three filter and activation will be relu let me just copy max polling let me just copy drop out so as i will uh, go deeper into into the network i will also increase the number of uh, con filters okay so any reasons why why do we need to increase the number of filters okay so that that's it and what i will do so i have added uh four convolutional layers okay so 1 2 3 and 4 and now what we will do we will add uh, the dense layers so i can add uh, a flatten layer and then i will add a dense layer so can you tell me what what should i put in the output layer how many neurons it will be a single neuron right because we are performing binary classification so we can simply put sigmoid as the activation in the final layer and then we can compile our model with binary cross entropy loss uh great avi optimizer as adam okay and matrix as accuracy so we roughly have uh 56 lakh parameters in this model and we are going to just train it from scratch okay so adam is like a default choice these days okay so the optimizer is adam and the matrix is accuracy that basically means we will do uh, the gradient descent op optimization for adam because it works really well and the matrix on which we will evaluate our model that that is going to be the classification accuracy okay so that's what it is going to be so now you can see the model architecture so we are getting input of 224 and after the first convolution it reduces to 222 and before the dense layer it is of the shape 26 cross 28 cross uh, 26 cross 128 so one trend that you need to notice as you go deeper into the model you need to increase the number of channels okay so channels means uh, as you are increasing your receptive field that means uh, if you are looking at an object from from a large distance then you will find more complex patterns in that object as compared to a single object okay so let me uh, explain you with the help of one example so let's say this is a telephone and if if you are just looking very closely you are looking at a very small 3 cross 3 region in this object you will have fewer patterns to detect okay but as you move it away from your eyes okay as you move it away from your eyes you will see okay there are different type of complex features that you can see from your eyes so as you go deeper into the network you see more complex features and to, to detect more complex features you need more number of filters so that's why we start with 32 filters we gradually increase them to 64 and finally we increase the number of filters to 128 okay 
so are you are you getting this uh, vineet has asked this doubt so this is the reason vineet so that means the number of distinct patterns that you can catch will be less at the lower layers okay but as you go deeper into the network you have a large receptive field you can see a large part of the object and that can that will contain more complex patterns such as the eye of the cat or the ear of the cat or the body of the cat okay so that's that's the reason why do, why do we need to do so okay everyone is getting great so let's uh, now uh, come to the training part okay so we will uh, use the keras image data generator library to uh, make the data uh, ready ready for the uh, model okay so we have trained data generator that's going to be image dot image data generator so what we will do we will do some augmentation on the uh, original image as well so we will rescale the data by the factor of 1 by 255 that will help us to do the normalization okay we will add some uh, shear augmentation we will add some uh, zoom augmentation that will allow us to take some random crops from the images and those will be like uh, you are zooming into some part of the image okay and the magnitude is around 20% and we will do horizontal flip equals to true so why we cannot do vertical flip in this kind of a data any any reasons of uh, just doing horizontal flip so we should not invert the x ray okay so all the x rays will have the same vertical orientation that's why we we should not do vertical flipping in this case and for the uh, test data we will just do the rescaling we will not apply any augmentation on the test data so we have uh, trained data gen and we have test data generator and uh, in order to create the actual uh, generator function so what we will do we will call a method on this object so this is an object okay so this object has a method called flow from directory so train data gen dot flow from uh, directory okay uh inverted x ray is i'm not uh, okay so augmentation why we are doing so let's say uh in that in the test set if you get inverted x rays then you should get uh, invert your x rays in the training set also but all the all the x ray images are properly inclined in one direction so that's why the vertical augmentation will not help but flipping can still help okay so flipping will uh, help to add more variations in the data and it will help to fight overfitting as well okay so we have to specify the directory here so that's a covid dataset slash train and then we have target size that's going to be 224 cross 224 and then we have the batch size that's going to be 32 and let's say class mode that's going to be binary we can do binary classification okay so if you have uh, multiple images you can uh, set the class mode as categorical as well similarly for the validation data generator we have uh, let let me just run this part so what it does is it automatically picks all the images from uh, this directory that we have to specify that we have specified here and it converts those images into 224 cross 224 and we give the batch size as 32 okay so that's what we do it it says it found 224 images belonging to two classes okay and uh, if you want to see what classes it has found so i think uh, there is a function called class indices or something like that let me see that it's class underscore indices so we have uh, the label for covid category as 0 and for the normal category as 1 
so ronak is asking why the size is 224 so 224 is a standard uh, standard choice okay it's not too big it's not too small and most of your image net models are also trained on this particular size and if you keep a very big size your training will become difficult and if you keep very small size you will miss lot of uh, detail, uh, fine fine features okay so we have train uh, generator dot class indices so we have now constructed the model we have the data generator ready we just now need to train our model that's the only thing that is left okay so target size in the file generator uh, okay so what happens is so here this input shape is uh, you are telling the model okay this is the size i will feed feed to you okay but when you are actually loading your data you have to resize your model or uh, resize your data into this shape so this will actually reshape your images when you, when they are getting loaded into the ram okay and since uh, we are not going to load entire data all at once we have created a generator here okay that's what we are doing so i hope i have answered your doubt okay so mit please do not uh, send random messages okay there is no recursion going on here okay it's not recursion class okay so same thing we have to do for the validation data generator also so we can say okay uh, let's load the let's create a generator function for validation data that's going to be uh, test data generator dot flow from directory okay and here we need to specify the same all the same parameters like so let me just copy this and put it here and it should be now the val folder okay so batch size is the number of images that you will uh, load in one batch so we have test data set how do we generate the final indices for the labels so uh, basically it automatically does it so it it is giving you can see from this dictionary you can see it, it's giving a label of 0 to the positive cases and it's giving 1 to the other cases okay that that's what it is going to give so we have this ready and you can see we have around 60 images in the validation uh, data we have, we have done a, a 80 20 split okay so 80% training so why do we divide it by 255 so good question so basically what happens is uh, when your input features are uh, let's say if if they are pretty big okay if they are pretty big they are not normalized then uh, in order to get good results you also need to have large values of these particular weights okay so basically let's say if your weight initialization is done from 0, 0 and let's say if the data is same data is normalized let's say this is 0.8 this is 0.9 this is 0.1 then to do the classification you can work with small weight values 0.36 0.32 and so on so let's assume uh, this this is the final point of convergence and here let's say the weight is Uh, 0.12 and here it is 0.13. So if you're starting from a initialization which is close to zero, and then you're uh, reaching a weight which is like let's say between zero uh, to one, then it will lead to early con early convergence. But if you have uh, start with large values of input, then you might get large values of weights, and you end up getting a very far uh, far convergence from the origin. Okay, so that's uh, that. basically affects your convergence if you do not do the normalization and also we need to try with different learning rates as well okay so rizul i have explained it briefly but that's the normalization part basically okay 
so now final part of piece of code that's we are going to uh, train the model by calling the fit generator function so we can give uh, train generator we can give steps per epoch as 8 i'm just going to run it for let's say 8 or 10 epochs let's say for 10 epochs and validation data is going to come from validation generator and validation steps is 2 okay so the training is about to begin oh, sorry model dot fit generator okay validation so spelling mistake here So keeping our fingers crossed, okay, let's see how how it performs. Okay. So so we 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 are done with the first epoch, and uh, uh, the first epoch is not uh, good because it's it's just fifty five percent of accuracy, and the validation is fifty percent. But uh, you can see it, we are starting with the baseline accuracy of fifty percent. That means even with the random case, you can achieve 50%. So your model must perform better than 50% in order to learn something. So we have done around four epochs and you can see we have reached around 90% accuracy till now. You can see it's, it's training in uh, four epochs. And in fifth epoch, we have training accuracy around 91% and validation is around 98%. Why steps per epoch is eight? So let me okay tell you. So when you have a generator function, it it uh, so why I'm using Google Collab? Okay, so uh, one reason is I'm uh, doing streaming from my Mac. So my Mac CPU is already under a lot of load. It's it's getting heated up. So I do not want to put any further training load on my Mac. Okay. So that's one reason okay so data set is small yes you can train it locally on your machine it may take 10 15 minutes okay but you can see uh, it's it's going on the training is going on we have uh, completed 10 epochs and we got uh, close to 96 percent accuracy so it's 95.31 on training and close to 96 or 97 on the validation set so you can put more number of epochs. You can put checkpoints to save the best model when you get the best accuracy. You can uh, draw plots and so on. Okay, so this is basically the training part. Okay, so anything, any any doubts in this particular part? Okay. So now uh, let me uh, also show you the some of the results that we could uh, that I got. Uh, from my previous training, okay. So you can see the model size, okay. So model parameters is not much as compared to your uh, standard ImageNet models. It's it's a pretty simpler model than I would say, and uh, I've not used transfer learning as well because. Uh, of two reasons okay so you can try this experiment using transfer learning as well but uh, what i thought is key let's first try to train it from a scratch on a simpler model that will help us to establish some baseline accuracy okay so the, so you can see with a simple cnn model also we are getting a baseline accuracy that's around 95 or 96 percent on this kind of a data and if you go with transfer learning then you obviously you need to perform better than this baseline okay and also when you use transfer learning, uh, you cannot directly use the ImageNet weights because they are very different. Okay, ImageNet is a very different data set from the chest X-rays. So it may not give uh, two great results unless you fine tune all the layers uh, very carefully. That's going to be a very uh, wise or uh, you, you, you have to do a lot of uh, uh, tuning okay so that that's going not going to be uh, that straightforward because both the data sets are 
uh, very different. So there are two challenges in transfer learning. So the data sets are very different. So you have to do a very careful fine tuning. Plus this data set is also very small. So unless we get more number of images in coming days, let's say uh, 2000 or 3000 COVID images, then we can establish some baselines and do some uh, transfer learning type of models as well. Okay, But still, you can try out transfer learning. I'm not saying it will not work. It it may work. It may not work uh, depending upon how how well you are able to fine tune your model. Okay. Uh, Uh, yes, is it possible to visualize how our uh, network is uh, differentiating features? Uh, yes, you can do it. So you can actually uh, implement a grad cam technique on it. And you can uh, try to find out which regions of the network are focusing on which part of that particular image. Okay, so where where is the attention? Where is the silency map? Okay, so that, that would be the next part. Okay. But since we have already like uh, short our time limit, we won't be covering this part as of now. But if you're interested, you can uh, read about these techniques. Okay, so you can learn about class activation mappings. So one thing that I want to uh, uh, cover is the confusion matrix for this part. So I got the confusion matrix that was really good. So let me show you the confusion matrix that uh, we got for this. So let me just open this in my machine. So the results from the previous training, okay. Class activation maps, okay. Or you can use uh, read about grad cam. So Yes, so when, when we evaluate our uh, model, you can see loss was continuously decreasing. And when we evaluate our model on the training in my last experiment, I got around 98.6% uh, accuracy and around 96.6 on the validation data. And also you can save this model and you can make predictions and you can plot a very nice confusion matrix also, okay. So, So if you see what is a confusion matrix, so confusion matrix basically uh, gives you different type of matrix. Okay, so you have let's say two cross two matrix. So let's say these are your predictions and these are your actual values. Okay, so let's say predicted label is zero or one. That's let's say COVID and normal. And here we have COVID and normal. Okay, so this is on the test data. So basically this this box represents true positive. That means the patients which were having uh, COVID were correctly identified as COVID. So that you can see we, we all the patients have been correctly classified. Here you have false negatives. Okay. So that means patients that were positive, but they were classified as negative. So you are getting a zero here. And this column represents, uh, this box represents true negatives. Okay. So that means patients which were normal and they were classified as normal. So this number should be high. This number should be high. This number should be close to zero and this number should be close to zero. That That is the best confusion matrix you can have. So in our case also, you can see it's a pretty good confusion matrix. And you can see this number should be is false positives. So that means uh, patients who were normal and they were fa falsely classified as COVID positive. So we have two such patients. So we got uh, two false positives in this case, but we got zero false negatives. Okay, so that means the classification that we have done on the validation data is it's pretty good. Okay, but s since you cannot make conclusions out of this unless you have uh, an expert radio radiologist opinion on it, also you uh, get the visualizations and you also need the more data. But as a learning experiment, we we did this. Okay. So, so how was it guys? So do you find it useful? So should we do some more sessions? Okay. Like these. Uh, convex optimization useful in ML. 
uh, so so there is a book by i think peter boyd on uh, convex optimization okay i think uh, i don't remember the exact author okay. but uh, okay i will sir i will let you know okay i do not remember which is the best book i think this this one is the book on convex optimization if you want okay but for practical deep learning uh, you do not uh, need to go into those details okay okay guys so thanks a lot so if you have like uh, some feedback you can uh, also uh, reach me out through my email and uh, we we will we will try to keep some more sessions so more more of our mentors are going to come up with some more uh, sessions on different assignments that you can solve okay so we will be uh, discussing so okay so books so uh, one of the books that's pretty good in maths is uh, the book by christopher bishop Okay, that you can refer that book. Uh, you can also for deep learning, you can refer the book by Ian Goodfellow, DeepLearningBook.org, and you can also refer the book by F. Cholet, who is the author of Keras. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, Nirmal. Okay. so you you try out with uh, different approaches okay you let me know in the comments what accuracy you you were getting and also feel free to link uh, link your model github link in the comments below uh, if you can try cam visualizations that will be great and once you have the cam visualization ready okay so that basically tells you okay in this image there is a football so cam visualization tells you where it is football where where the football is present okay or why the model thinks it is a football okay so uh, we need if you are a beginner you are starting learning deep learning you start with keras and keras is based on uh, tensorflow backend uh, once you want to build some production ready models you can shift to pytorch or uh, tensorflow but i i will suggest you to go with pytorch it's easy it's pythonic and it's you can really learn it very quickly once you know uh, keras as well okay okay so uh, uh ragav you you can mail me i will uh, send you the links okay so abhishek uh, you can use the coding blocks app you can load your videos okay so uh, Rag, some of you are asking about my course so let me give you a quick overview so you can check out my course on coding blocks online so basically i will suggest you to uh, go with the either with the master course or go with the track and the cnn part comes in the deep learning course that is part 4 and very soon i am going to come up with some new stuff in the in this ml data science as well so stay tuned i will keep it as a surprise okay and there are some few announcements that are going to happen around 1st of may in uh, next 3 4 days okay so ml uh, dl or data science okay so you can just follow this order if you want to start uh, from the basics you can follow this order that i have given on the course you and uh, go with the python then you go with the machine learning libraries you go with the python for data science then you uh, go with uh, this part the machine learning part you learn the various classifiers linear logistic regression gradient descent optimization knife base sbm neural networks all the stuff then you go into the deep learning part learn about neural networks cnn rnn lstm and beyond that as well okay okay so uh, ram crash problem so basically that means your tensors are getting too big so either you need to reduce your uh, batch size or the model is so big that you cannot fit it into the google collab memory and also google collab uh, allows different amount of memory at different periods of time 
okay so sometimes you may get a larger memory sometimes you get a smaller memory so if you have a very big model that does not fit into google cloud then you have to use google cloud platform or microsoft azure okay okay guys so we will end at this particular point i will put put the link to the code in the description and uh, thanks a lot for joining us today and i will be doing more sessions so keep your questions for the next session as well and there will be session on competitive in just two days so make sure you subscribe the channel and also inform your friends we are uh, like putting lot of efforts uh, make a series on fake face generation using gans okay okay we will do we will do something about it okay okay thank you bye bye and stay safe wear your masks and do not go out even after the lockdown is over okay so bye bye and good night